I'm ready. Hey, everyone. So good to see you. It feels like a family reunion of sorts. I'm just looking at all the people who are here, noticing who's popping up in chat. I'm just super, super excited for this town hall because we have some amazing people. We have started at Getting Smart, our new Pathways campaign, where we're focused on these six pillars that you see on your screen, where we talk about learning doesn't have to learn happen in the classroom and we know that for a fact right um these last couple of years have truly taught us that children can learn or students can learn anything anywhere at any time and so how do we take these experiences apart to make them meaningful for students and then how do we credential those experiences in a way that they have like this portfolio of resources before they leave high school so that when they talk to who they know or they talk to who knows them, they are ready and they are armed with all the information that truly tells their story. And we do this through accelerated pathways. We do this through new learning models. We create all of these opportunities so that we can truly personalize learning in a way that's really intentional for students. But in order to do that, we need to focus on what we're talking about today, that support and guidance. We need those people in the room who are going to show them how to unlock their potential through the people that they know and through the people who knows them. And then we need to begin to create our, throughout create policies and systems and structures so that it is these experiences and all of these resources are truly equitable and not just for some students, but for all. So we're going to do that today through three amazing individuals. And when I thought of like, who are we going to be talking about today? I thought of an old, like start of a joke, like a social capital builder from the Bronx, um, a head of school and slash getting smart columnist and a resource and a researcher pushing us to think about how do we, how did we get here and who helped us get here, zoomed into a town hall. And this is who we ended up with. So Julia, I will turn it over to you to make the introductions for the rest. Thank you so much, Shawnee and team Getting Smart. Great to be here. Um, I rarely incorporate jokes eloquently into the kickoff of any call. So thanks for doing that. Also that poem gave me shivers. So appreciate the spiritual note to start off on as well. Um, great to see many familiar faces here. I'm Julia Freeland Fisher. I'm the Director of Education Research at the Clayton Christensen Institute and have been writing, researching about the power of social capital to expand equitable access to opportunity for the past five, six years. Um, and I'm here to talk about relationship mapping. And I love getting Smarts Pathways work. Uh, and I also think I have no idea what anyone is talking about these days when we talk about pathways, because what are they? It's this level of abstraction. What I do know about pathways though, is that they should be social and they should be asset-based. And the topic for today, relationship mapping, is a strategy um, that can actually ensure that whether you're serving a guidance or support function or an unbundled learning function or all sorts of functions within our quote unquote pathways, that you're actually paying attention to the social side of opportunity and to the existing relational assets in your students' lives. Um, we really anchor this work on equity, um, given that an estimated half of jobs come through personal connections. And yet we know that students inherit unequal networks into the knowledge economy. At the same time, we know that job exploration, post-secondary exploration is a social process in which whether or not you've inherited the network you need to get the job you want, your existing network has assets already within it. Um, and Ed is gonna talk through some strategies to actually tap into and extend on those assets. Uh, this concept of relationship mapping, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, we published a paper this week that my colleague Maris can put into the chat, uh, interviewing leading organizations doing this work, including Ed and Tyler's organizations that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's a repeatable process to understand and visualize who your students know and for them to reflect on those connections and hopefully be more likely to mobilize those connections in new ways. There's also a framework that I'll put in the chat in a second from our colleagues at the Series Institute around how adults can responsibly and equitably facilitate the activity of relationship mapping to make sure that young people are thinking about their assets, thinking expansively about who they already know. Um, and I wanna just underscore before we get to Ed and Tyler's sort of wisdom on this topic, uh, the use cases where this can be useful. Um, and, and this really comes from years that, of Historically, my work has looked at networking as 
building relationships with people you don't already know, rather than having new types of conversations with people you already know. Um, and so why would we map students' relationships? How do we actually unleash that version of networking? The first is that programs are increasingly using relationship mapping when they are teaching young people about the power of social capital so that students understand they already exist in a network. This isn't a new phenomenon. This isn't something they don't already have. The second is to increase the likelihood that students mobilize their networks because it's actually helping them visualize those connections. The third is if you're trying to increase students' sense of belonging and access to support, super critical in school districts and colleges today that are worried about attendance, enrollment, sense of belonging, finding out who they already trust is a really powerful starting point, right? Rather than trying to engineer trust from the outside in. Fourth, if you're trying to expand your students' professional networks, ask them who they already know and whether they've talked to those people about their careers. We so, we so often step, skip that step in service of employer partnerships in the Pathways conversation and, and forge partnerships beyond the families and communities that our students are already members of. And lastly, if you're trying to boost persistence and success long-term, and Tyler will talk about this, helping students to map their relationships on an ongoing basis will help them to think about social capital, not as a one-time asset, but as a lasting reservoir that they can continue to dip into. So Ed and Tyler are gonna take the floor after this and I'm gonna facilitate some questions for them. And I wanna give you a sense of why they're here and why they're such powerful leaders and exemplars in this space. Ed hands down is the person that has pushed me most to think about social capital building through an asset-based lens. Um, he runs an organization called Social Capital Builders and has more recently launched an app called My Opportunity Hub that he'll talk about a bit. But really the entire premise of his training that he offers, if you go to the next slide, um, the training that he offers, which includes Finan uh, sort of social capital literacy, students actually thinking of this as a literacy, social network analysis, which is Ed's term for essentially mapping students' relationships with family, developmental ties, and what he calls gateway ties that I'll let him talk about, and social capital development, using those lessons to then in an ongoing way mobilize their networks. Um, so Ed, I'm going to turn to you in a second, but then quickly, Tyler, um, I've known over the years wearing different hats, but most excitingly right now, he is one of the few school leaders in America that named social capital as an outcome at his school and has every single student track their student social capital through something called a social capital tracker. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see an example of this in action. It's um, painfully simple and yet deeply powerful as a practice in that uh, young people at the Forest School that Tyler founded and runs are um, in the context of a self-driven curriculum and learning experience that he'll touch on, keeping track of people that they know who are like them, who are different from them, and who are in positions of power in their community. Um, and as they go throughout their journey at the Forest School are sort of prioritizing these based on um, where they are in their journey. And so these are two examples of relationship maps, right? Again, it's, it's um, kind of ridiculously simple. I never know how to, to describe it and make it sound sexy. That's sort of maybe you guys on this, on this town hall can help uh, kind of make this shiny and make it more appealing to more districts and, and colleges to adopt. But this is the gist of what we're talking about today. So we can take the slides down. And Ed, I'd love to start with you again as like really a leading voice and and brain and doer in this field. Um, you've, you've often talked to me about framing social capital to young people as a literacy, almost like financial literacy. And how does helping young people analyze their networks, map their networks, actually build that literacy? So can you just sort of talk about that, how, how you've approached that in your work? Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, Julia, to you and, and Clay Christensen, thank you for all your work on social capital. Uh, you know, we were out there fishing and didn't know what we were doing and just, and then we saw other people. So then we started building a network of social capital builders and Julia has been a great advisor to us. So thank you. Uh, yeah, like, so why social capital literacy, right? Why not, right? Um, financial literacy is huge, you know, the outcomes are dubious, but we know the, the power of social networks and helping young people understand that power is something that we take very seriously. So we created a curriculum called Foundations on Social Capital Literacy, 
where we educate young people about social capital. We did a random survey of Americans where 50% of Americans didn't have enough social capital literacy to build their own career. So what we mean by that, they don't understand the hidden job market. They don't understand the uh, redundancy. They don't understand the difference between bonding, linking, and connecting capital. So we figured that offering this to individuals would be a very powerful way to get them motivated to do the mapping. We have to show the benefit of social capital. We have to quell some of the notions of nepotism or favoritism and show how social networks is a reality in our society and how meritocracy is not, right? And how so many people, it's not about what you know, it's about who knows you and likes you. It's also about where you go. So now that whole thing about it's not what you know, it's not who you know, that's blown out because now I've heard 50 million versions of that. But it's key to help young people understand social network concepts and then look at their position in opportunity spaces. And I think that's what you're referring to as social network analysis. Now we focus on three areas and Julia put up the diagram. We focus on the familial family members. You know, we've just completed a course with 25 students here in Howard County, Maryland for the Workforce Development Board. And we do numerous courses and we're always astonished by the number of young people who don't even know what their own family members do for a career, all right? Especially now they say even, in the, and when we're talking about family, we're also talking about fictive kin, right? Uh, how many times we're in the class? So here's an example. We're in a classroom, you could do this with your students. You're in a classroom and you ask any one student, what is your career goal? And they'll say, I wanna be a police officer. And then you say, does anybody in here have a family member, a friend, or somebody in law enforcement? Every class, hands have gone up, whatever occupational area. So that's why I kind of started off. Individually, we may not know, but collectively we do. So developmental connections are former teachers, former probation officers. You know, we have one student, so I don't know anybody. And I want to say something about relationship mapping. People don't know who they know. And we train entrepreneurs, we train youth, adults, everything. Uh, and social network analysis is such a key component of what we do that we start off every session with it, right? And, I, and one thing we're looking at right now is what we call primers, right? So primers are key in helping people remember who they know. So like we'll throw pictures up of schools and think about your high school graduation and who were this is for entrepreneurs. Think about who you know. So there's a lot of science around social mapping or, or so what we call social network analysis of helping people understand who they know and who they need to go to get to opportunity spaces. Now, the gateway connection. So remember, we're talking about familial, developmental and gateway. So gateway are people that you know, and you might well, we call that loose tie. So as social capital builders, there's familiar. I don't know how much y'all know about this, but there's strong ties. You know what that is, right? There's weak ties. You'll know about that, right? There's dormant ties, right? But then there's loose ties. And loose ties are all your strong ties, strong ties. So what we do there, we tell a student, well, you know, well, my father works at the factory. Okay, your father works at the factory, but who does he know at the factory? Does the factory have a legal department? Does it have a computer department? And those gateway connections are connected to that young person, but they might be two or three degrees removed. So once we engage young people in an activity, they're like, wow, we know everybody. Now we're, we're very careful about controlling for redundancy because you have to do that, right? Because like Julia opened up the, the, you know, they might have, so that factory might not be a major factory. So we have tools and techniques to control for redundancy and helping young people understand what redundancy is in social capital literacy so they can watch out for it when they do the social network analysis. But go ahead, Julia. Right. No, that's super helpful, Ed. And again, just to reiterate, and this is in the, the paper that we can share and materials that Ed can share after, three types of domains where you're having students think about their existing connections. But to your point, you may have to prompt them in multiple ways to actually identify those individuals. And all the research shows that, in fact, relationship mapping should be a repeat activity because any of us asked who we know would sort of do a first pass. And there's obviously going to be additional people. I want to talk about, Ed, like you and I could talk the entire hour about this. We won't do this, I promise. But um, why more people aren't doing this? <laughs> 
And I think part of it is a logistical barrier, but part of it is outright bias that schools and programs may not think that there is value residing in students' networks if those students come from lower income neighborhoods, backgrounds that don't look like the staff, et cetera. And you spend a ton of time doing training um, with staff, not just delivering your curriculum yourself. And I'd be curious how you think about that mindset shift of not just helping students see the value latent in their networks, but helping staff see why relationship mapping is an incredibly productive, social network analysis in your case is a productive exercise. Yeah, um, it, it's simple because they don't have it, right? So when I go into any organization and I'll do it with your organization, I'll say, what are the five services your young people need to survive or thrive? And you'll say, they need mental health, they need education, they need job training, they need food, they need housing. And I'll say, great. All right, name an organization in your city that provides your service, the name of your personal connection there and your CARDI score rating with that individual, which, which is the way we determine social capital, right? So this is how we kind of start off our training. So the majority of organizations we go to, 50% of the staff don't have personal connections at these organizations that they self-identify as necessary to serve their young people. So if you're not building the social capital to build, you know, MOUs are not social capital. We see this every day. We work with some very high risk individuals who need key services, yet those, those connections are absent in a lot of organizations. So we believe in a philosophy, this stuff is not taught, it's caught, right? So why teach young people what they already know? They may not already know individually, but they all know collectively. So instead of teaching a young person how to write a resume, we wanted them to go out there and that's how our curriculum is built, that every lesson, excuse me, every module, they have to go out there, whatever that objective of that lesson is, they have to go out and make a connection with a familial developmental or gateway asset that can give them more information on that, right? So they say, what do, you, what do you do with a resume? How did you write your resume? Where did you get your resume printed? Uh, what did you do with it? Uh, how did it work out for you? And can I keep you updated on my progress, right? Because the young people are just gonna be with you for six months or a year anyway. So you wanna start as part of the educational process, building those pro-social connections with them in the community. And that's why Mayo is so important because once young people engage their uncle Theo, yo Theo, you got a resume? What do you do with it? Oh, I didn't know. The first thing the uncle says is, Mio, I didn't know you were looking for a job. Like, oh, like it's ridiculous. And we see this every day, you know? So I don't even know if I, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now, but. Yeah, well, can, can I editorialize just one sec on that, Ed? Like what Ed is describing here, right? Relationship mapping, social network analysis is a way to start to identify these ties. Then how do you mobilize them? And I think the low hanging fruit, and again, I'm putting this in quotes, the pathways conversation, whatever the heck we mean by pathways, is that we're running students through all of these activities and we're not viewing each and every activity as a relationship building opportunity. And, and if you can codify that in your model, suddenly you're unleashing um, immense assets that otherwise go ignored or sort of one-offs. Does that Let me ask everybody, 97 people on this call. So think about this. If a young person goes out in whatever subject you're studying, right, and they speak to a familial asset about that, and they, and, they, and they tell them, hey, can I keep you updated on my progress? This is what we call the process of anchoring. Anchoring is getting an adult emotionally invested in your professional development, right? So you begin the anchoring process by, hey, can I keep you updated on my progress? And then the young person keeps them updated on the progress, right? So every month they're saying, this is what I LGD, learning, giving, and doing. What do you think that individual is going to start thinking about that young person? And I think you all say, oh, they're going to think they're serious. They think they're trying hard. They're starting that social capital building process. So for us, we define social capital by something called compassion, assistance, reciprocity, trust, and information, right? So when we say, I don't say I have, I'm, I, have a, I, ha I have network with Julia, I say I have social capital with her. Why? Because there's an understanding of her goals and the reason behind her goals. That's the compassion part. Assistance. I provided her assistance in many areas and she has provided me. And that's the assistance of reciprocity. Trust. I spoke to her. Right? I asked that, what do I got to do to earn a gold star with you? Right? And then information, we're constantly sharing information. So, in the presence of those, that's social capital, right? So, the problem with networking, and don't get kids so caught up mapping because the opportunity cost of networking is lost social capital. I want to say that again the opportunity cost of networking is lost social capital. So, yes, you can have your young people go out there, but you know, a lot of the research says you can only build strong relationships with six, 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 really five key people. So, what we want, you know, so just be very careful of chasing, you know, the shiny thing, shiny thing. Focus on 
And that's why we love, that's why we love, our, of course, our model is that we have young people focus on the social capital assets within who already, where they already have some of that cardi, right? They already have a little trust, right? As opposed to somebody, you know, and, and those, that's, that's important too. We're working on that yeah. area too, but our main areas with the familial developmental and gateway connections. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to go to Tyler and we'll circle back to you, Ed, because I think that, um, well, folks I know want to learn more about your model and maybe you can add some resources in the chat too. But Tyler, riffing on what Ed just said, and again, Tyler's the head of a, a school outside of Atlanta called the Forest School and also, oh my gosh, I'm going to botch the name, Self-Directed Learning Institute. Is that right? No. That works. Institute Amazing. for Self-Directed Learning. Just yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's like the Zoolander thing. Um, so <laughs> I, I want to just sort of what Ed was just touching on, right, is this idea that like, if you don't do this with purpose and intentionality and uh, attunement to what students actually care about and what they can sort of manage socially, this becomes sort of a, an exercise of just like naming names, trying to multiply contacts, etc. And I think your social capital tracker, again, as a fairly simple but really elegant way of helping young people make visible the invisible in their lives it has some there's some philosophy behind why you're asking them to do this and what your what categories you're asking about so can you just we put it up briefly but can you just talk about your social capital tracker and, and kind of maybe even where it came from sure um so you all hi everybody uh, great to be here uh julia to ed and and the getting smart team and, and folks who are here it's an honor um it, uh, when you saw it, it's got three main categories and Ed, Ed referred to them, you know, the sort of linking, um, bridging and bonding social capital that we all have, um, bonding, you know, we ask learners from elementary, from, from as young as grade two, uh, all the way through senior year in high school, you know, who, who do you know that is somebody who's like you, you know, um, someone who has maybe, maybe the same race, maybe a similar age, maybe a similar worldview or religion, or socioeconomic background, um, you know, and then who do you know, and then you have a strong, you know, trust built relationship with that person. Um, and then they would sort of write down those names, you know, in, in the far left hand column, the, uh, the, 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 the bonding. And then for the bridging, we, we would ask, okay, who do you know that's different than you in some important way, you know, maybe they live in a different part of the world, or they believe something different than you and your family, or um, they have, uh, you know, uh, maybe they speak a different language, or um, have a different worldview. Um, and, and then you have a strong relationship with them and then they would list those. And then, you know, we talk about linking and someone who's in a position of power, someone who can maybe get you an apprenticeship or a job referral or make a connection for you to someone that you've never met before. Um, someone who can, um, you know, maybe employ you, uh, ultimately and, 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 you know, and, and who are they and, and have you built strong relationships with them? And then just kind of filling that out. And then that, you know, template or graphic organizer, if you will, just kind of serves as something that they update every year, multiple times per year. And then at, at the course of their experience at our school, there's a number of signature learning experiences that they have that introduce them to more and more people um, that they can then, you know, form those trusting relationships with and fit in there. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, and where it came from is really personally and professionally. I mean, personally, I, I grew up all over the rural South. Uh, I moved, uh, eight times between the ages of zero and 12. Uh, it was on the one hand, exciting. On the other hand, it felt like chaos um, a little bit. Um, and, I uh, didn't really have many people in my family, uh, that I knew, um, that, that were in the linking category, um, honestly, but then my, my parents, when I was 12, they told me if you wanted a car, when you're 16, you have to pay for it. And mm -hmm. so I started my own lawn mowing business, cutting grass. And sure enough, by the time I was 16, I had made $5,500 and bought a 1989 black Chevrolet Blazer. It's the best car I've ever had. Uh, and, and I learned a lot from that. And for a while, as a young adult, I thought, look how hard I worked. Aren't I something special? And, and the older I got, the more I realized how much privilege I had, frankly, and how many other people other than me set me up for success to be able to do that. You know, my neighbors trusted a middle schooler, uh, you know, rather than hire a professional company. My parents let me borrow their mower. My grandfather taught me how to save money and put it in a bank account. My friend even gave me the idea to do it. Um, and, and I realized it's, it's, it's that cloud of witnesses, you know, it's that whole network. It's the, um, it's the emerging, it, it's the practical help that emerges from caring, trusting relationships. And then the, the longer I've been in the field um, and just lived as a, as a human, 
you know, the more uh, Sarah Heminger, the CEO of Thread, has a TED talk around the the poverty of isolation that that a lot of young people um, in this country suffer from. Um, and and I've seen that. I, I just know a lot of young people who didn't have the privileges I had in terms of like having a surrounding uh, group of caring folks. Um, and uh, and so that's a great motivator. And then coming across the research um, that you know Eds and other organizations have highlighted, uh, especially the the Harvard Kennedy School of Government as well has done a number of research around social capital. That, uh, Julia, your research as well, um, you know, has helped me to see as a school leader, this is one of the strongest predictors of, of educational success for young people. And so we've got to figure out a way, you know, to infuse this. And just to like underscore in less emotional, more technocrat language, what Tyler just summarized with the lawnmower story, right? Like the concept of social capital, which I realize I should have defined up front, is the idea that our relationships contain resources and many resources over time, depending on what it is that we need. And we contain resources that we can offer to our relationships. So I, I think one of the reasons why both, both models that we're looking at and talking about today are so powerful is that they go beyond the kind of cliche in education that relationships matter and they start to mobilize the, relation, the resources exchanged through relationship. I have one more question for you, Tyler, and then um, Shawnee, I'd love to hand it back to you to facilitate some of the questions coming up in the chat. But, um, you know, one of the things that is so powerful about your model is that it's it's really student driven. And I want to underline again, relationship mapping is a standalone strategy, but in both of these models, it's contextualized in a whole deliberate experiential curriculum. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think about sort of students' ability as agents in their networks to mobilize and grow their networks and how you've structured learning experiences around that concept? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're so social as humans and, and one of the pillars of our school is learning to live together, you know, um, in an intentionally diverse environment. And um, we, we ask a lot of questions at our school and, uh, you know, give very few commands. Our learners enjoy a whole lot of choice. Um, it's a, in a self-directed environment, they're setting their own goals, they're going at their own pace, um, often studying, you know, what they want. Um, they, there's a lot of peer evaluation and self-evaluation uh, that they're doing on a regular basis and they're celebrated for, and they're even making some of their own rules, you know, for the school. Um, and so with the social capital development, they're really in the driver's seat of that. Um, you know, they fill in the, the blanks very practically and we don't judge it. We say, that's great. We celebrate it. And then we just ask them, you know, every, uh, you know, six months or so, uh, how do you want to update this? You know, um, who are the strongest relationships that you have with these folks? And we let them, they're, they're, again, they're in the driver's seat. We're not, we're not, we're not judging it for them, uh, but we're posing the question. Um, you know, in order to graduate from our school, you mentioned, uh, Julia, our learners do have to have demonstrated mastery that they have strong uh, bridging, bonding, and linking social capital. In order to do that, we've created a signature learning experience called practicals, similar to what firefighters do to get promotions or, you know, uh, karate students do to advance belts. Um, they have to show evidence and, and learners can show evidence from anywhere in their life that they've built strong social capital. So they're in the driver's seat there. And what the stories that they come up with and the people they introduce us to are amazing. Um, they each also form their own dream teams. Um, when I was at Transcend, uh, there was a, a collaboration with Achievement First in Greenfield and Northeast to create this signature learning experience where a learner surrounds themselves with a group of champions who sort of uh, meet uh, quarterly to, to hear their goals and give them feedback on their goals. And that team is made up of not just parents and siblings, but, you know, friends and pastors, rabbis, imams, coaches, teachers, mentors, um, and our, our learners do that. And they are the ones who make the dream teams and they're the ones who run the meetings and they're the ones who, and so those folks are a part of that social capital tractor as well. Um, we often uh, at our school, we bring in experts to give our learners feedback on their work and learners have some free time to kind of meet them um, and to form that anchor uh, relationship that Ed was talking about. Um, and it's on them, you know, to to decide who they want to follow up with and connect with. And at our school, middle schoolers do um, one apprenticeship every year um, for a week, and then high schoolers do four a year. Um, and so if you're with us, middle and high, you will have done 19 apprenticeships. And of course, that builds your linking social capital. And and they choose the apprenticeships. They actually drive that whole process. We, we as a guide, which is our word for teacher, um, you know, we guide them to, uh, to write an email that it's going to be hard for professionals like folks on this call to say no to 
and then they'll get on the phone and pitch themselves for an apprenticeship and then narrow it down and eventually do one. Um, and, uh, and that's a great way, you know, to anchor, as Ed was saying, and to, uh, um, you know, form those. And uh, uh, yeah, and then, and then lastly, the, the, we do a, a reflection protocol mid-year and end of year called um, after action review similar to what they do in the military and, and in corporations and mid-action review where learners kind of step back and monitor their progress and look at their progress. And they share that with their parents. Um, and that's kind of a homework. That's the only homework assignment they have uh, all, all school year because we don't have homework at the school. And they, um, uh, and, and again, that's where they update parents on their social capital development and growth. And again, that's on them. Um, and they're sort yeah. of, we're offering the question and they're sharing it. Awesome. And I, I dropped in the chat a link to an article where um, Tyler synthesized a bunch of these components of his school. Again, I'm just sort of trying to make the connection of relationship mapping as a strategy to identify assets, but then what experiences might you embed in the pathways you're building that uh, deepen and expand the names on those maps, right? Um, I want to pivot to questions because there's been a ton. Shawnee, as our fearless MC, tell me where we should go. <laughs> yeah, there have been some great questions and comments that are flowing through the chat. So thank you, everyone, for doing that. I want to start with um, something that Daniel said just, just a bit ago about who you know changes all the time and about how youth and adults need to understand how to maintain ties to people that they met in the past so that they remain in the, uh, available in the future. And we understand that social media is a component of this, but that doesn't necessarily create those deep relationships um, that you all are talking about. So what are some strategies to make that happen? Well, I mean, we're always advocating, you know, you think about how many young people participate in summer job programs or internships, and they're not given a tool to stay connected to those worksite supervisors, right? So I think that's a big gap in the, in the, in the system. Uh, so we should be training young people, you know, the about the importance of social capital and give them tools to connect. LinkedIn is not that tool. Um, so we need something specific for that, to, that builds that social capital building process. So that's why we ventured forth and created Myo. Tyler, I didn't know if you wanted to chime in as well. Yeah, that resonates. I could just add what's coming up for me is something about for K-12 institutions, a robust alumni program, you know, at our schools. I, one of our graduates, she's called Maya. She lives in Chicago. Um, I asked her for a video, uh, just like a minute long to give existing learners at Forest advice on, you know, what, what she would have done differently. And she was like, her, her video was basically, I wish I would have taken more advantage of the relationships at the school. And I actually, I immediately picked up the phone and called her. I was like, Maya, you're an alum of Forest. You still have access to those relationships, but she just didn't have that mindset. Um, and in fact, our very first graduate, she's called Hadley, her sister, Sydney Kate emailed me today and said, uh, hey, I'm looking for connections or whatever. So like something for me is coming up about, and we're a young school, so we don't have this great thought out, but around how our alum can look to K-12 institutions, not just undergraduate and graduate institutions, which I think have really robust alum programs, but K-12 institutions for those connections as well. I think that would be a cool pivot in the field. And I just want to add to that. I think the, the more you can look at closing that network. So if you create, um, if you have like, let's say, you know, how many people in that student's network and you could figure out a way to, now there's a downside to a closed network, but it's more accountability for that, for those participants in that network. So there might be a better chance of them staying connected to people when you close that network. Now we're trying to do a project, a pilot with the National Guard Challenge Program. And one goal is to make sure that some of the staff from the organization are part of that network, right? So they can actually keep that network closed and make sure there's accountability for the young person to stay, to stay connected as well as uh, for their opportunity guides. Julie, as we think about this connection, just want to circle back to your concept of activating the network for good for, for the students. Can you say more about that? About activating the network? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, I mean, I think- for difference making for impact. Yeah, well, so let me take a step back. I think what we have heard in our field interviews around this concept of understanding who students already know and how they might engage those people in new ways, it's a more effective exercise if it's anchored to a goal. And it's potentially an even more effective exercise if it's anchored to a goal that students give a damn about, just to be blunt, right? And, and so often we have goals in our traditional systems that may not be the same as students' immediate goals or interests. And so the more that there can be 
conversations, exploration around what do students care about in their immediate school community or in their future? And how can they map relationships with that goal or interest in mind and start to activate them? And that's a very different, again, I, I, I still think that, you know, if you're running an internship program and you're only doing employer partnerships through your internship coordinator and not through your students, you're going about it wrong, but there's a broader opportunity, I think, to start with what do students care about, back to Tyler's point around sort of self-driven um, learning and engagement. So that's just quick thought. Yeah, and so as we think about the community, as you were just talking about, um, John's question is, it says, this is all great stuff, but how does this fund, and this is for all three of you all, how does this fundamentally change the, the structure of schools? How does this change the schedules, the cross-curricular cross learning, how time is used? What are, the, what are the conversations that need to start within the community to really kind of disrupt the system? How much time do we have, guys? No, I, I know. Know. 40 years of Tom Vanderark's career in, in a nutshell of a question. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, you know, my, my specialty is more with workforce development organizations. So, and that was a great question. I think, I think it was Tom. So we realize that even before they do social capital, they have to understand the social capital framework and see, you know, so for example, we get so much, and we still haven't figured it out. We get so much data when young people go out there and we say, okay, find somebody, you know, like, you know, uh, we'll do an activity where we say, okay, um, here's a great one. Um, here are the top 10 companies in your city, right? We pull that data, right? Okay, now we want people to identify somebody they know who works there. So majority of kids come back with somebody they know through a you know, strong side of weak side or something. And now you have all these names on the board, right? What do you do with that? Like, how do you process that, right? So we ask organizations to really think about data. Like, what are you going to do with this data? Uh, there's a lot of liability issues that have to be discussed, right? We're talking about connecting young people, even though we're trying to connect them with their familial and developmental people they know, still, who knows that person is a pedophile or whatever, right? So what is the liability on there? So we have lawyers speaking about that, releases from parents, but I think some of those issues have to be addressed before I think we see long, long adoption by programs and schools. I'll name three things that just come to mind real quickly and happy to talk offline about this question. I think one is downward pressure from higher ed and employers is going to be what potentially changes the grammar of high school, not just the political will of people on this call. Uh, and higher ed is having to shift right now due to um, changing labor market and an unsustainable business model. I think number two, what gets measured gets done. Uh, so to the degree that we start measuring student social capital and their lack thereof, it can become a more central priority that actually we reorganize schools around. Um, and then, well, maybe, uh, well, number three, I think, is like who gets to accredit learning, right? Because in some ways, if teachers are the only arbiter of credit, suddenly all of these other assets in students' lives don't have say when they could actually be um, attesting to students' mastery of different concepts and be part of a more decentralized structure. So those are real abstract, but the three that come to mind for me. And Tyler, did you want to weigh in? Yes, and I'll drop this in the chat too, just some early thoughts. But when I think about the different components of a school model, you know, from a, a vision standpoint to really, you know, activate this, just naming it, championing it from a curriculum, you know, sort of explicit teaching and modeling of it, many different, you know, ways and methods obviously to do that from an assessment standpoint. I mean, the tracker that that we're sharing today is just one example, but portfolios, 360 feedback surveys, lots of different methods there. Um, I think allotting very intentional time, you know, in the daily weekly schedule for these kinds of experiences and, uh, you know, really give it value. Um, and then, you know, hosting experts uh, in the school, hosting visitors, you know, in the school to facilitate connections, frankly. Um, and then parent education is crucial. Um, bringing parents and caregivers along to help them um, crowdsource, uh, you know, opportunities. We have a parent, a private parents Facebook group. And, you know, it's, I'll often put up there, hey, does anybody know a baker? You know, one of our learners wants to do an apprenticeship with a baker. And then I'll get, you know, responses. Um, and parents are excited about that um, and see that they have value to add, not just to their own children, but to the children of the community. Um, you know, in terms of roles, I mean, what if, you know, when we hired our teachers and educators and leaders, one of the bullet point lines was their ability to 
uh, leverage and share and access their social network on behalf of kids. You know, I mean, it really brings into light, I think, the role of the teacher and educator mentor. Um, and then that they, teachers themselves, would facilitate those connections, you know, and be a liaison, if you will. And that that's, that's not extra adding to the plate. That's a part of the plate of what it is to work. Um, from a community practices standpoint, I think just celebrating the relationships that grow in, in many different ways and through parties and stuff and meals, um, bridges and partnerships, you know, for apprenticeships um, and project-based learning where learners can get uh, rub shoulders with uh, other folks uh, from a tech and tech infrastructure, just different, um, you know, platforms that might facilitate it. I know there's a guy on the call, Burke, um, who's got a platform um, and others that are out there as well um, to try and facilitate this from a space and facility standpoint you know, what space in our classrooms can facilitate kind of co-working collaborative, you know, uh, meet and greets, if you will. Um, I've already mentioned managing parent expectations and then potentially if it's an independent school or, um, you know, maybe the onboarding or counseling department of a public school, you know, that entry assessments to sort of assess, you know, what what is the strength of their social capital up front? Yeah. Just some ideas. Yeah. I, just want, I want to throw a real easy one uh, in there because uh, it works on this, you know, in my field, young people get incentives, right? You know, you come to school, good attendance. So one thing we all want to ask the students, like if you can get a gift for somebody under $25, what would it be and why? And who would it, who would you get it for, right? And in giving, because social capital, let's get to the fun, fundamental. It's really about giving, right? It's about sharing. It's about giving of yourself to others. So when a young person tells somebody, hey, I'm, I'm going to school, that's really giving, right? Because they, they're showing that they're making an investment in, as, to be part of society. But, but, but thinking about the organizations, if, if, if your staff, you want them to build or, uh, social capital others, what are you giving them to give, right? And that's an exercise, right? Here's the alphabet, A, B, C, what are everything you can give, A, you know, and just have them start thinking about, oh, I can write a LinkedIn review for Ed. Yes, that would mean a lot to Ed De Jesus. How many kids have I spoken to in my lifetime? Thousands. How many of them wrote me a LinkedIn review? Right, because the program in school is not teaching them how to build that social capital with a possible for them, um, you know, a linking type of connection. Yeah, thank you. And you all mentioned kind of the role that the teacher can play in this process. Um, and Howard asked in an earlier at, at an earlier time, and he was saying like this process is pretty clear to him um, after hearing you all talk about how it applies to students, but how do you align or describe the value to teachers to do their own relationship mapping? Well, how we do it with um, frontline youth workers is it's a economic motivation. And this probably is not answering your question for teachers, but it makes a lot of sense for us like, why wouldn't you want every youth program to know who you are and how well you work with young people just in case your youth program closes or gets defunded, right? So you're building the social capital for your economic opportunities, right? You know, it's to help the young person, of course, but if you know these other organizations, if you develop quality relationships, you'll be never looking for a job. A job will be looking for you. And that's, that's what we try to teach to young people and to adults. It's like, this is what you got to do to stay connected and be part of that network. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. Go ahead Julia. No, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, we're doing some implementation support work, and sometimes it's as simple as just having teachers themselves do the relationship mapping exercise, or even just answer in conversation with one another the simple question of how did you get here and who helped you. I think the piece of this that is more of a systematic lever, though, is that part of what's daunting for teachers is if they feel like they are the sole broker of opportunity and social capital for their students versus this being a shared responsibility across the institution, district, what have you. And so I do think there needs to be a leadership level of pooling social capital um, so that teachers have a reservoir to dip into when a student says, you know, do you know a baker? And the teacher doesn't know a baker, right? So it's it, this has to live at both the institution and the teacher level in terms of responsibility to be sustainable and, and positive, right, for educators as an experience. Go ahead, Tyler, sorry. No, no, it's, it, it's, that resonates deeply. And, and for us, it's it's two main things. One is just kind of as uh, caring adults, we'll, we'll just do some storytelling and testimonials about the impact in our own lives. And then I think more powerful than that, honestly, is just introducing the learners to what we call experts, which is like high performing professionals who come in, give learners feedback on their work and learners see the value in that. Over time, they're like, wow, that was really 
real world, amazing feedback. And I got a chance to meet with this really cool person who's like me in some ways, but further along in their life. And then they experience that and, and, you know, see some opportunities that way. Um, so it's just kind of by doing it. And I, I dropped a video um, that sort of gives an overview, um, you know, of that process for us. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge Beth, who has her hand raised. Beth, if you want to come off mute and ask your question, please feel free. Um, yeah, I want to ask maybe a little more of a provocative question. And I, I love all this stuff. And I'm, I'm working on a curriculum right now that incorporates the mapping, but also um, critical thinking and critical mentoring. So what about like you, Ed, I appreciated you and you mentioned uh, mediocrity and favoritism and nepotism. And so we're in a system, though, that in some way isn't so great. Like, I mean, this whole who you know model isn't so wonderful. And so I'm just wondering how, so for the young people I'm gonna be working with, it's about also acknowledging like, this isn't so wonderful. Like there's some white supremacy values here. There's like things that aren't so wonderful. And I am trying to incorporate some critical mentoring and some critical conversation in this um, because I don't want the system to be like this. Um, I don't want it to be about like, well, if you didn't know this person, you didn't get all this. Um, it's not so great. Like, I, I mean, I, 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 so I'm kind of torn about always promoting this as this is how it should always be. Um, and if you didn't know the right person, then, hey, you're out of luck, um, too. So I'm just wondering if you incorporated any of the critical conversation. And also, when you get into these places of power, you know, do you want to keep not doing it? Um, and in fact, I know someone who just uh, hired someone in an internship who knew no one, did nothing. And because of that. So just thoughts? Yeah, well, we definitely have a whole uh, module on uh, racism, classism. Uh, and, you know, we definitely, part of our literacy, we teach young people about the concept called homophily. I think that's something really important for them to learn and learn the difference between racism and homophily and how sometimes just people are not normally in your network. And we're actually creating a tool called Not In Your Network Tool to help people see, especially industry stakeholders. I don't think social capital is only focused on the learner. It should be focused on the key industry stakeholders as well as what are you doing to share social capital with young people and how well, how close, how many hops are you away from a young person? So I wanna take, and we actually have the leadership here in Howard County uh, in their cybersecurity industry because they can't find black and Latino workers worldwide, right? Because they're not normally in your network and that's that social capital information sharing so our tool would look at an uh, average student, let's say in Howard County Community College, and you know, through some data-driven AI type of stuff, we want to see how many hops that so-called industry stakeholder is from that young person and then engage them in steps to reduce the hops. So I think you know, racism, discrimination, sexism, you know, transphobia, all that stuff is real. But the beautiful and, and, and Professor Roberto Salazar, you should read his papers on social capital. It's really powerful because if you're really honest about helping young people navigate these historic systems, you want to connect them to the people who navigated that, right? So, you know, who do you know who has achieved despite, right? And then go to them and figure out their strategies and what can you glean? So the answer is in the community. But it's 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 helping them connect to those who could be their opportunity agents through those items. I think that's the power of social capital for us, and that's why we promote it so heavily. You're not going to get that answer from Rupert. Okay. I, I could build on that. Um, the, I love the article you you put in here too on uh, networking as a first generation student can be hard. You know, I wonder for those of us in K twelve, what if this were titled "Networking as a First Grader Can Be Hard"? Here's how to get started, so that by the time they're you know a first um, you know first generation college student, uh, they've built the muscles. You know, Beth, your comments made me think of we have a learner who started with us in eighth or ninth grade. She and her her uh, mama had lived in. Uh, you know, three hotels in two years, and she came in with very little social capital. And um, it was an honor and privilege to meet her and her her mom. Um, and and you know, if you compare her social capital to that of some of the other uh, learners um, in our in our um, school, very different. Um, but over the course of four years with us, and and uh, this individual graduated recently. Um, this learner built the capacity and competency to be able to 
build her own uh, social network. I have full confidence that she's moving into college now. She has the ability to continue to uh, extend and deepen, uh, you know, her bonding, bridging, and linking social capital because she's had that practice. And so for me, it's it's. But but you know, even now, how does her social capital compare to those that came in with even greater privilege? There's probably still a difference there. But to be honest with you, I, I wouldn't be surprised if her ability to continue to grow her social capital might outweigh the ability of those learners who came in with you know, already a lot of social capital. Um, so for me, it's, it's a lot about practicing instead of, uh, you know, finding their purpose, they're building purpose seeking skills. And instead of completing their social capital, they're, they're building their, their ability to build their own social capital. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm going to pause this right there. I know we could just talk much longer. Um, but like we said, we will include a recap blog with all the sources and links and Julia, I'll throw it over to you um, for the poll and any last thoughts. Oh, so no final thoughts here. I think um, if you guys can just share your reaction to this, it's always helpful for us to know what's landing and not in our research. And just um, huge thanks to the wisdom of the network on this entire call, and in particular, the wisdom of Ed and Tyler, who I think are at the cutting edge of a, a phenomenally more asset-based approach than what has been the norm in our systems. So thanks so much. Yeah, uh, huge thank you to everyone. And Tom, do you want to um, share any closing thoughts before we close? Uh, just a, a big thank you to Tyler, Ed, um, Julia is always um, super insightful, provocative, useful, uh, and thanks to everybody in chat. What a terrific um, contribution from um, five dozen of you out there. So thanks all for being here. Shawnee, thanks for showing on the way.